Start recording. Welcome, everybody. Give it another minute or two. It's great. Wow, there's some diehards. People have been on every session. I see Eric, nice. and Ethan, and Tony with the hair. Hi, Tony. There's that stupid face. <laughs> It's good to see you all. Good to be seen, man. Sorry I missed you the other day. <laughs> yeah, no worries, man. Hope you had a good time in Massachusetts. Beer was great. You guys are doing a great job. Not according to your Instagram. <laughs> well, I'm a, I'm a hype brewer now, so, you know, it's, when I don't see any hype, I get all upset. Well, thanks, everybody, for, for being here. There's a few more people in the waiting room. and let them in. Uh, make sure everybody's on mute, please, if you could. All right. Oh, we got to let Hutch in. We can't start until Hutch, Hutch is in. Absolutely. Hutch. Sorry, there's a bunch coming in. We'll start about a second here. I want to get distracted. Well, I just want to thank DWS for sponsoring today's sessions. Um, so far, I see a lot of familiar faces. It's been going pretty well so far, virtually. Um, we're happy to have you all. We are recording this, and it will be on our YouTube channel um, a little bit later today. So I, this session um, was one that we were really excited to do um, last year. And it really was after having a conversation with Brendan and Mark Schultz about, you know, we used to do, uh, we hear from the wholesalers, which is important um, every year at our conference, but we felt like we didn't have a session where it, we need to hear from the brewery side. We just heard the wholesalers talking about how things are going. And after conversations with Mark and and Brendan, we felt like, you know what, we need a session like this. You know, you need to hear it from, from brewers um, and uh, exactly what it's like to get into distribution. So um, we're very fortunate to have Brendan Palferman from Harris Beach. Brendan, Brendan focuses on intellectual property matters and other complex lit litigation, including patent trademarks, copyright uh, and trade dress infringement actions. A major focus of his practice is representing and, and counseling breweries, wineries, and distilleries. Brendan is also an award-winning home brewer. Um, he, uh, we know Brendan really loves beer and he walks the walk for sure. So thanks Brendan for this. And then super excited to have Mark Schultz who is the co-owner of Prison City Brewing uh, along with his wife, Dawn, who really does everything, but Mark is there for support. Um, no, I'm kidding, Mark and Dawn are great. They just, uh, they've had the pub and brewery for a long time now and just opened a 20 barrel brew house in Auburn. And if you haven't been there, Mark's in the tasting room right now. You got to unmute yourself, um, which is, uh, it's an amazing facility. And um, the really cool thing about Mark having been in the brewing industry for, for as many years as he has, is he also has firsthand experience for working for a wholesaler. He worked for TJ Sheehan um, for four years as well. It gave him good insight on, um, on the distribution part of things as a brewery owner. So without further ado, oh, real quick too, I wanna to mention, let's use the chat function for questions. If you don't have questions, this is gonna be very interactive there. They don't have PowerPoint presentations. I think the point of this uh, really is encouraging a conversation. So um, if you do have a question, do put it in chat and, and then we'll just uh, have you unmute. I'll call you out or raise your hand and I'll call you out. Because um, I know Mark and Brendan would really love to answer your questions. But before we get to that, Mark, let's start with you. I think, you know, yep. you and I've had a lot of conversations about, about this, and you're very passionate about this topic. Um, yep. Why? Why is this something that you wanted to do and, and you felt like people really needed to hear? Well, I think it's just because it's sales is my DNA. That's, that's who I am. That's what I do. I, I learned to stop apologizing for that a long time ago. Craft beer does have this stigma of brewer versus salesperson. And, and I kind of got tired of that. I, you know, you make beer to sell beer, right? That's why we're all doing this. And um, I, my entire background is in sales. And I kind of felt like I had a Bill Parcells moment where, you know, Bill was trying to I think he said, I'm, I'm going to stop apologizing for who I am. I'm a football coach. And that, I, 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 that resonated with me in some weird way where I was like, I need to stop apologizing for who I am. I'm a beer salesman and I'm damn good at it. And, um, you know, through these CBCs, which I find incredibly valuable, you know, in the two distribution panels that were there, 
you know, and Paul and I talked, it was, it was valuable to have the wholesalers there and kind of giving their perspective and how do they go to the market and, and whatnot. But having worked for wholesalers, um, both directly and indirectly, I also know how guarded distributors can be. They're very vague in their answers. They don't like to give you all the information. They like to give you just enough information. Um, they don't like to talk about pricing. I know Oz um, from Stoneyard was having an incredibly hard time getting an, an answer, uh, a question answered about pricing. And there's just certain things they will and won't talk about. So I kind of approached Paul and said, you know, I think that is valuable. And I think, you know, having a real discussion and, it's asking questions and getting answers. I don't have them all. I have a lot of them. None of them are perfect. None of them are going to work for everybody on this uh, thread. Um, but I hope to add any kind of wisdom I can. I know it, I said this as we were getting started. People probably look at this like Mark Schultz from Prison City, that small brew pub in Auburn, New York, that doesn't distribute beer is going to talk about distribution. What sense does that make? But I started working for a small distributor in Lake Placid in 1996 or seven after working for Chris Erickson at the pub and brewery. So I've actually been in all three tiers of this thing. I, I've been on the street stocking the grocery stores. Um, I then went to work for Sam Adams, um, all kinds of sales experience there. I did manage TJ Sheehan's craft beer department uh, responsible for almost $12 million of sales for all of Western New York and craft beer. So I feel like I can answer a lot of questions. I do have a lot of opinions about how to go to market, mistakes breweries make. Um, and I just hope to add value in any way I can through that. And uh, Brendan, I know you deal a lot with uh, contracts lately. And, and it's funny, you said something to me once um, you know, it, me not owning a brewery and just working for the association that, that really, um, you know, stuck with me, you know, during one of our conferences, you said, uh, I you said a lot, a lot of calls I get are from breweries, small breweries saying, I, I want to get into distribution and I, I want to sign a contract and they really don't know where to, to start. And it's always starts out with the, you know, very wholesaler or distributor, you know, in, in their favor. And I think you said to me very matter of factly, well, you know, it's just a starting point. You can negotiate that. And I don't know if a lot of, a lot of new breweries understand that those are all negotiable. Yeah, I think I think a lot of breweries, just people in general, are used to getting these form contracts. And when they get them from the distributor, they're often in a PDF. The implication being, just sign this. You know, don't change it. Or, you know, it's just boilerplate. And you know, let's just start selling beer. Um, but as we talked about way back when, these contracts have been written and refined by the wholesalers' attorneys over the years. These are, you know, with with a few exceptions, these are like really powerfully pro wholesaler agreements. Um, and if you're not reading it really carefully, if you're not redlining it and sending it back to them, you're, you're probably making a pretty big mistake. What are some of the most common mistakes um, um, or, or things that breweries should look out for uh, in a contract that you would say, yeah, don't, don't ever accept this. This is a bad start. Um, there's a couple things. Um, one thing we're seeing recently um, is either, uh, as we talked about right before this call, either invasion fees or prohibit, uh, prohibitions on direct consumer shipments. Um, for me, those are both non-starters. Um, by invasion fee, I mean, you sign with a distributor in a territory and then the contract says, if you send to anyone in this territory, including you know, online direct to consumer, ETC, you have to pay us you know, $4 a case or whatever it is. Um, for work that you're doing yourself, your brewery made the sale, your brewery shipping it, but they they want a chunk of that. And that's sort of how they're, you know, adapting to um, you know, the, the new freedoms that breweries have um, under uh, the regulations the government has passed under COVID. Um, other things I would watch out for are um, clauses that are only one way. So, for example, there'll often be an indemnification clause in agreement, which basically says, you know, if if we, the distributor, get sued for something to do with the beer, you have to cover all our costs, all our attorney's fees. You want to make sure there's two of those clauses, one covering you and one covering them. Sometimes they only have one. Um, so watch out for anything where it just says something that only, only puts an obligation on the brewery and not on the wholesaler. Um, one other quick one, um, watch out for assignment clauses. So oftentimes they'll be, it'll be silent. It'll say, you know, 
uh, or it'll say uh, the distributor is free to you know assign this contract and your distribution rights to another distributor so long as they agree to the terms of this agreement. Um, I don't I don't think that's right. It should be um, this contract and my distribution rights can't be assigned without my written permission. I'm signing up with you, wholesaler number A, not wholesaler number B. I want to have a say if you're going to sell my rights to somebody else. Those are just a couple of like really high level things. So Mark, yeah. you worked on both ends. Yeah, what are your yeah. thoughts? So it's, it, this is such a great conversation because it, it, this really gets to the heart of the matter of distribution. And it is a very weird and sticky relationship that you have. It's, it's such, a, and I, I write this every time. I actually used to work at Ithaca Beer too. I forgot to mention that as a sales manager. And Dan Mitchell and I were having a conversation one day because one wholesaler was selling to another and we were trying to decide where to move the brand to. And you know, Dan didn't had a bad relationship with that wholesaler that I really thought was going to be the best fit. And ultimately I came to this conclusion, all wholesalers suck. Every single fucking one of them are terrible. Um, it depends on, you know, what brand you are, what your experience is, but ultimately they're all terrible. And they're really not. Um, you can look at them both one of two ways. They're either an asset or an ally, um, or they're your enemy. Um, and I think somewhere in between lies the truth. There are some really good wholesalers for certain brands. There are really terrible wholesalers. And I have a lot of opinions about that. But finding out this is going on YouTube, I'll refrain from saying who I think those wholesalers are. But you can PM me and I'll gladly tell you. Um, it, it, but there's also this other part of the situation. It's really one of the few examples in business that I can think of that that mentality of all wholesalers suck because if you distribute, like I see Ethan Cox uh, here and I know he uses a distributor and anybody else that uses a distributor, a lot of times I'll ask a brewery, who is your biggest customer in the market? And they'll often point to an account or the Blue Tusk or, you know, uh, Coles and Buffalo or whatever it is. And I'm always kind of fascinated because your biggest customer, if you are with a wholesaler, is your wholesaler. You sell beer to the wholesaler. They then take your brand and sell it elsewhere. And yet there's this really kind of, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm lacking the word, but there's this weird relationship that exists between supplier and distributor where, you know, there's all this tension that it's, it's just weird. Like you would never treat your wholesale, uh, your, your best account that buys your most draft the way you treat your wholesaler with this tension you know, in this, you know, combative nature. And I always found that kind of perplexing. Um, but I also get it, haven't been on the other side, you know, haven't been, you know, with a brewery, like, you know, this guy just doesn't get it, isn't doing the right thing. So ultimately it kind of comes down to, in my opinion, the brewery on um, what your relationship with a wholesaler is, how you're going to market. And it kind of starts with who are you? What do you want to be? Um, how are you going to market? do you have dedicated sales staff? Like, are you invested in getting to market and selling your brand? And I like to quote Jack Davis, who I did work for and is a friend of mine, you know, uh, all, all being said, you know, distributors don't sell beer. They distribute beer. You know, they get beer to the shelf. They get beer on the tap. It ultimately relies on us as the brewer to sell the beer, to get it to pull through. And I, and I, so there's a lot of this, like just, weird gray area in the relationship that exists. And I think it's important to recognize that and to have those conversations to kind of understand. It's just not that simple that I make beer, a distributor wants my beer, they're going to go to market. And if they don't sell it, I'm going to pull out and move along. There's just so much more that needs to go into that. Um, even from vetting a distributor, you know, someone approaches you, do you go to Buffalo and march up and down the street and talk to retailers and ask them their preferred supplier who is their preferred distributor like do you do any homework do you do any due diligence whatsoever i would say nine times out of ten the answer is probably no that someone wants your brand you get excited and you're like let's sign on the dotted line and to brennan's point you don't read the fine print and you can find yourself in a very precarious situation so it's, it's just like overall it's a it's a very odd weird yet necessary relationship that i think you need to consider all factors before getting into that relationship. If that makes any sense whatsoever. 
Are there any questions out there right now uh, with anybody? I'll, I'll ask one. Uh, I'll follow up on your point, Mark. I mean, I asked this in the chat, but when you consider a distributor today, yep. because I do think that this didn't always, this wasn't always the case, but are they really a partner in growing your brand or are they simply a partner in logistics? I would, I would argue the latter. I think they're a logistics company. I think there are certain brands that they want and that they want to have in their portfolio. You'll often hear beer distributors say, you know, we're not a brand collector. I'm here to tell you as a former distributor, they're fucking brand collectors. They want to block anything from their competition that they possibly can. And they are willing to take on your brand and give it a shot to keep it away from Joe down the street. And yes, to your point, it is logistics, but you know, there's some value in those logistics, I would think, Ethan, like you think about it, you know, moving, you know, I've, we've been open for just a few months here and I'm exhausted just from moving beer from our North Street location to our State Street location. I'm 48 years old. I'm tired and moving beer four to five days a week. It's heavy. You look great. It's no, I know. Thank you. Um, but it's heavy and it's, you know, it's snowing, it's zero degrees out and you're moving that beer. That alone is tiresome. Okay, now let's move forward. Let's get into accounting and think about what wholesalers do from you from this perspective. They take care of all your paperwork. They register your brands in a lot of cases. They chase the money, you know. Uh, well, I know, I, I see you saying no. Some of them do, some of them don't, Ethan. They, they, you, it, it depends on your relationship. But there are so many other avenues that wholesalers can take off of your plate it does just come down to is that worth it to you or do you want to self distribute i should say i i, I often thought about this conversation of you're thinking about signing with a distributor why we're, we're in new york state we have one of the strongest associations and the best laws in the country you can self distribute and I, but i get you know both sides of it self distribution is a pain in the ass for everything I just said, lugging beer around, driving it across the state, lugging kegs up and down stairs, collecting empties, you know, delivering a refund for the $30 keg deposit, picking up your empties. That's something I just learned about that I never considered after all my years in this business is, you know, redemption centers calling me saying, hey, I've got, you know, like $80 worth of your empties. You know, there's, there's, there's a lot of that. And it, it really does you just have to ask yourself, what is the better scenario? Self-distribution and doing all of that. Do I have the infrastructure? Am I willing to invest in that? Or do I want to sell my brand and give up all the margin to a distributor and let them handle everything? And I just need to make the beer and hand that off. And then from there, the question is, how are you going to treat that business partner? You know, are you going to get into bed with them and really invest? Do you have a salesperson that's going to go march on the street and help sell your brand? this idea that you can just hand your brand off, like send your kid to college and, you know, they're just going to do everything without any kind of further guidance is I think short-sighted and, and you need to be able to invest in your brand. You need to go make the calls. You need to get in the car and ride with the reps. You need that share of mind that comes up nonstop um, in big brewery world. Uh, that's why, you know, they don't just worry about the big breweries because, the volumes there, the margins are there, but there's investments, you know, these big breweries, they put people on the street, they put dollars in the market, you're competing against a lot of different elements that you, you just have to consider. You've got a Sorry. question from Hutch. Yeah. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Hutch. Oh, okay, so, hey Schultz. Um, so we're a small brand. Um, I think some, most of you guys know who I am, but if not, um, Seven Barrel Brewery. So we have limited capacity, especially these days, since we usually sell most of our beer to our on-campus restaurants. We have lots of capacity. So we are entering a, distribute, uh, a relationship with a distributor. Uh, we have very limited manpower in the sense that it's me. Yep. And so I am concerned about the idea that, that um, although I am happy with the distributor we're choosing, and I feel like they have a good vision for our brand, I'm concerned about not having salespeople to be able, out there supporting the brand. So what are the things I can do to make our partnership with the distributor as successful as possible? Um, I mean, in this day and age, I, you know, it is a, 
different time, Hachi. I don't have a great answer, but just even getting on a call like this, having some face-to-face -face interaction. Um, I don't know if distributors are doing these sales meetings anymore. It used to be Friday mornings of my life were tied up and getting up at 5 a.m., driving distant places, getting donuts and coffee and delivering it to a sales room. I don't know if that really exists, but ultimately you have to just figure out how, do, how can I multiply myself within the four walls of that distributor without physically being there all the time, whether it's an email or a phone call with the brand manager and coming up with a plan. I, I'm sure most, most places probably aren't even doing, you know, a work with or ride along, depending on how you call it right now. So you definitely have to be nimble and creative on how do you get their share of mind and make sure that they're thinking of CIA when they're on the street selling your beer. And if right now it's harder than ever, otherwise I would say just once a quarter getting in front of their sales staff and having conversations with them, maybe it's doing something like this. Like, I know you don't, but can I get on a zoom with, you know, your sales staff Friday morning from seven 30 to 8 AM and just kind of talk about who we are and what we're doing, you know, get creative and think about it that way. And let's take you to a bigger picture. So outside of my particular situation, which is weirder than most people, what yeah. would you say for any small brand? Like well, if you could say there's there's three or five things I say this is the things you've got to be doing to make your relationship with a distributor work. What would can you think of a couple off the top of your head besides what you just mentioned? Yeah, I would say number one, um, you know, be the face of the brand. Be you know, I I don't like I don't like saying I and me a lot, but I will say that in my experience, one thing that differentiated what I was doing versus and I'll call it my competition, any other brand is. I was out and in their face more than anybody. I hustled harder. Um, I, I would sell on my own. I would figure out like, how do I multiply myself? Again, I, I, I love that term. How do I multiply myself within their sales organization? The one thing salespeople don't like to do is push a rock uphill. They want to find that. That's why, you know, they'll sell, you know, your New England style IPA over your Schwartz beer. You know, even though the Schwartz beer might be more important to you, um, they want the path of least resistance. And if you're out there and able to help them sell your beer, that's valuable to them. If you're, if for some reason you're landing a sale for them and they don't have to think about it, that's extremely valuable to them. And I know you can't, especially as a brewer, get out and do that, but you have a lot of relationships. You know, you know, people you can call and sell a draft line to. If you can do that and deliver that to them and their jobs made that much easier, I think you get that share of mind and they're thinking about you and your brand a lot more often. Tony, Nova has a question. Tony, did you leave us? No, uh, I think you kind of answered it, but I think okay. also you kind of said, uh, you know, we don't have really the time as brewers to be out there and talking to every, every account and stuff like that. So when does it, when do you, balance the like, okay, you signed a distributor. When do you actually, actually hire a salesperson? I mean, I, I think ultimately it comes down to, I mean, just, you know, how much volume are you moving in a market to hire a salesperson? Right. I mean, you're talking somewhere in the range of, you know, starting salary upstate New York, 30, $40,000. So you got to consider mileage depending on how, what their market is. You know, if they're driving from Buffalo to Albany, you get a, there's certain things to consider. So I think you got to figure out what your margin is on what you're selling and how much can you afford to pay somebody. And if it, if it even makes sense, I don't know, you know, I can also say this going back to my line of all wholesalers suck. I, I, I and remove COVID from the conversation. Can't tell you the last time I really see, and as a pub owner, I know we're a brewery, but at, at, at State Street, we carried a lot of guest drafts. I almost never saw a sales rep from the distributor. I just get an email and I had to do the work, you know, and figure out what beers I wanted to put on tap to complement what we were doing. But to, it, that's, a, that's a really tough question to answer, Tony. It, 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 it all de ultimately depends on how much volume you anticipate moving and whether or not you're ready to pay somebody thirty to $40,000 to go out there and, and move product. Um, and maybe I'm short, you know, maybe I'm overpaying this person, but, you know, maybe somewhere there's an answer. Maybe, you, you know, uh, 
you find an, I, I got an email from somebody in Buffalo that they work independently and they sell two or three brands uh, from other breweries and they get a stipend. It's like 10 bucks a keg or something. They get a percentage of the sale, but they work with several different breweries. So they're kind of like a brand ambassador. You know, maybe that's an avenue. Maybe you and four other breweries get together and say, hey, we're all going to chip in 10 grand and they're going to go out and sell our beers. Uh, again, it's just another way of getting creative and on short dollars to go out and move your product. I have a question from Eric that I think is probably about contracts. It'd be good for Brendan, I believe. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's more lawyerly, but with the temp contracts into like a new area, you know, like Philadelphia or something, um, it's, and if it's like three months or six months, is there any kind of a, um, like a precedent that they can do afterwards where, where say you try to sign with another distributor, they say that, no, we've already had a relationship with you, you know, you're stuck with us or you need to pay us or something like that? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, I've come across that in Pennsylvania, actually, many times, and Philly, uh, too, specifically. Um, so typically, you know, the, the temporary distributor relationship that you're entering into, they're going to be okay with it, and they're going to, you know, do what they promise to do and only keep it to that, say, three-month period. Um, but to protect yourself because they don't have to. Like once there's a, your instincts are exactly right. Once there's a franchise uh, relationship set up, um, they could arguably have you forever in whatever the, you know, quote unquote territory is usually in Schedule A. Um, so what I like to do in those situations is sort of like put a, a belt and suspenders um, clause in the contract where it says, well, uh, three things you can do actually. One, define the territory of the contract extremely narrowly. So if you're there for a festival or you're going to be at, you know, a stadium doing a particular event, make the territory, like the capital T territory in the contract, that stadium, not Philadelphia, not Montgomery County, not, not whatever, make it the territory for this contract is just that stadium or just this festival. So that's one thing. Another thing, um, which I'm sure is probably already in there, make it abundantly clear that the contract ends as of you know, three months from when it's signed or, or whatever the time period is. Um, you hope they live up to that. And then the third thing you can do is say, okay, if for whatever reason, somebody contests that this contract lasts longer than three months, um, set the buyout, like the fair market value payment as, if, if it's a fair market value state, like New York is, I believe Pennsylvania is, set the fair market value as like $3 or something like that. So that even if they contest it and you have to terminate the contract for cause, You've already agreed beforehand that the the fair market value that you both agree to is three bucks, and you send them a check for three dollars, and and you're out. Perfect. Beck, Thank you, Pete. Back, you have a question. Uh, hey, thanks. Yeah, um, actually, kind of kind of relates to um, that idea of fair market value, and maybe this is maybe this is different from state to state. Um, but if you're trying to set up an agreement uh, with a distributor and you're trying to value an established brand, if you've been in the market in self-distribution for a period of time, um, I've heard different numbers tossed around, but are there, are there metrics that are generally accepted by the distributors and by, and by the brewers? Yeah, so I'll take the first step of this one. I'm sure Mark has an opinion as well. Um, but in my experience, it's, you're going to have a tough time, unless it's a really established brand, you're going to have a tough time getting a distributor to pay something up front, um, which in my view doesn't make any sense because the second you sign that contract, uh, you know, the, the fair market value thing goes into place. And now if you want to get out of it one day later, oh, all of a sudden I want 5X or whatever it might be. Um, so uh, generally speaking, though, from what I've seen, what, what the distributors want on the other end when you're terminating with them theoretically is what they should be paying on the front end, which they usually don't, but is usually somewhere in the three to five, six range. Um, and that's a multiple of the, typically of the gross profit over the trailing 12 month period. Um, distributors, I mean, I would say it's, it's gone down a little bit in the last couple of years, but there are several distributors who their form contract, they seek seven X. Um, in addition to other penalties, if you terminate, um, there are some, some really bad contracts out there. 
Um, so you want to, that, that's probably, I mentioned a couple of things to look out for in your distributor contract, um, like assignment and invasion fees. I mean, aside from possibly invasion fees, the termination provision is gonna be the most important in the entire contract. Um, are you defining fair market value ahead of time? Um, oh, and for anybody who's in it, so section 55C, thanks to people like Paul and Dave Kataleski and Fred Matt, um, New York, in New York, you can now terminate a brewery, a distributing contract. Um, a brewery can terminate its distributing contract with a wholesaler by paying its um, estimate of the good faith value of the distribution rights that will be terminated as a result uh, of you exiting that agreement. Um, and if you can't agree, you get to decide what it is and you send them a check and if they don't like it, they can take you to arbitration within 45 days. So that's what we're talking about there with the fair market value. Um, and What's usually up for dispute is the multiple. What is the multiple? Yep. Um, and yeah, like it's, it's, it's usually in the distributors usually want in that three to six range, sometimes seven. Um, if they're really cool, it could be a tiered thing where maybe it's zero X for the first year, one X for the second year, or it could be, if you want to be creative and incentivize them, you could say, okay, if we sell, you know, sell a thousand CEs, it's two X. If you sell 2000 CEs at 3X, you know, you could, you know, uh, incentivize them that way, you know, if, if they'll agree to it. Yeah. And that's brilliant. And that, and that absolutely, I recommend anybody do that. You're going to get a lot of resistance from a wholesaler. I'd resist, uh, uh, but it's a very smart way to do it. Also, um, you know, be very careful about, you know, Brendan brought it up that T assigning territory, start with a particular county. You know, and give them incentives to branch out. Don't, I would say, unless you're feeling very comfortable, you know, there are wholesalers now that can distribute from, for every county in New York state. And I think to protect yourself, it's wise to start with a small area to give yourself leverage. Because if you're doing really well in that area, it's going to incentivize them to reinvest in your brand, to expand beyond that. It also gives you leverage to go and negotiate with other wholesalers and other territories. So ultimately, I think, you know, crux of this conversation is protect yourself legally, give yourself leverage. Um, and I think it was Fred Matt that said it two years ago in front of the wholesalers, like if you are self-distributing and you're moving away from that because you don't have the resources and you want to sell to a distributor, you know, move your distribution rights to a distributor, get paid, let them make them pay for your brand. You've done the work, you've given them the business, you should be getting paid for all that, those years of hard work that makes. I talk to distributors all the time that where I, I recently talked to dist or breweries um, about distributors, either at the beginning of a relationship or at the end. At the beginning, I'm helping negotiate the contract. More often, I'm helping terminate the contract. And when I'm terminating it, that, you know, they, they want their, their money at the end, but they're not willing to pay it at the beginning. So yep. oftentimes, the complaint that the brewery has is, hey, I brought in these 30 accounts. We're still in these 30 accounts or now we're down to 27 accounts. Like what am I right. paying for? You know? Right. Yep. Uh, Valuable conversations to have at the beginning of the, of the conversation. Yeah, for sure. Necromantic brew co. Is that Ralph? It is. Thank you. Hmm? So um, I just had a question. We're a, bit, a startup. We're not even open as of yet, but um, when we do, I was thinking of self-distribution. So, you know, yep. do you have any tips, uh, you know, regarding sales? Cause I too was in sales for basically my entire working career. Yep. Um, but I was more in the retail side and, and not food and beverage. So I know, do, is it common to use sales sheets and stuff like that? I mean, what's, what do restaurants, bar owners, you know, people that's going to carry the product, what, what do they want to see? What do they want to hear? And for me specifically, we're going to be gluten-free, dedicated gluten-free. So yeah. I can't, eggs and stuff like that, you know, for fear of con cross contamination on the keg line. So we're going to be doing cans, uh, you know, specifically. Sure. Yeah. I mean, back in the day, it was sell sheets and a pretty binder and whatnot. Uh, unfortunately, like most everything else, the internet kind of took over and you have things like untapped um, and you have beer advocate and you have, I mean, as a retailer, you know, that's where I would start looking like, okay, is this person brought in this product? I'm looking at it. What are the nerds rating it? You know, that's, that's kind of my new sell sheet. If I'm a retailer, I'm looking at that. Um, I'd say a sell sheet certainly helps a picture of your product, a description of your product, the ABV, the story behind it, the pricing, 
give them everything that they need to know, make it look as sexy as possible. I think a sell sheet could still help electronically or however you be. Um, but I just know more and more retailers are looking at those social platforms and what are people saying about this product? That, that's a huge avenue. I think anybody that sells beer anywhere knows how valuable that can be and how much it can also hurt you. Ethan, you got your hands up, hand up. Uh, uh, <clears throat> yeah, sorry. Um, you know, I just wanted to throw in there as a small piece of word of advice because we, we self-distributed for um, the first five, six years or whatever it was. And, and the we in that is really me. I tend yeah. to be more of a we when it comes to community beer works, but the truth is everything that Schultz was talking about was my job for a while on top of all the other jobs. Um, and the thing I will tell you about sales with respect to self-distribution is that the hardest part of self-distribution is it's something that the distributors do do for you. They separate the billing from the dropping off of the beer. It's really hard to walk into an account with beer when they owe you money and yeah. you really want to say to them, Hey, um, it'd be great if you paid us for those last kegs, you know, but I'm here. And uh, here's more beer and uh, yeah, we are, we are good. Cause you know, like it, it's just not the time to do your uh, AR. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not, you're just trying to drop off fucking beer but at the same time, that's when you have to see them. Uh, you got them. Uh, they don't return calls necessarily uh, or emails or whatever, especially when they owe you money. So that is, I think the one thing that I do genuinely enjoy about having distributors not hunting down the cash and it is the one thing about self-distribution that i was like outside of the effort like i was i was happy to do the hustle for as long as i did it uh, i too was too old to be moving kegs around etc cetera, etc cetera, all that all that crap driving in bad weather in a crappy van but um but yeah the hunting down of the money and to be the those two faces of the company in one no bueno difficult yeah, and I'll further your point, Ethan, in that we all have to be very careful, those of us in self-distribution, about accounts not paying us and not, I mean, legally speaking, they have terms. An account has terms and they need to pay us in a certain amount of time, seven to 14 days. And frankly, if they don't, we're legally obligated to list that account with the state liquor authority. That's what wholesalers do. That's what we do. And let me tell you, I mean... That is one big old nasty fat guy fart in church, man. It stinks. And guess what? They're never buying your beer again. You suck. They throw you out. They do it to wholesalers all the time. But guess what? The wholesalers have a large portfolio and eventually they have to come back. If you're self-distributing and you have to go down that ugly path, the reality of getting back into that count is slim to none. So that, that, that again, yep. is another advantage to having a distributor. They can do that dirty work. Every distributor has somebody in AR that is the four letter word at every account. Um, we all had it. Uh, when I was at Sheen, we had it. I got thrown out of, I can't tell you how many accounts because this woman called because I bought beer from you three weeks ago, but I haven't paid you yet. And somehow I'm listed with the state liquor authority. And if you don't know what happens when that happens is that account can no longer buy on credit from any distributor that sells any alcoholic beverage in the state. No wine, no liquor, no beer, no nothing. Okay, they have to pay cash on hand for every delivery they get until that debt is satisfied and the distributor lets the state liquor authority know that they've been lifted and then they can go back on credit. That is another weird is, dirty side of the and it's not dirty it's legal it, it's just legal but the reality is and i'll say it i don't know how many of us are really listing if you're a small brewery you don't want to list an account you know you don't want to be that person so yeah you gotta that, that that is to ethan's point that's another advantage who the hell wants to go in and say you know give me my money you don't want to walk in with a baseball bat i mean these are human beings and but the reality is they bought your product they owe you money they should be paying you so i guess bet the account too you know you can you can there's no reason the credit the, the distributors make you fill out a credit app before they give you you know uh terms you know 
I would argue most small breweries probably don't offer a credit app to an account and do any kind of homework, you know, on the account they're getting into business with. Let's face it, most of us are desperate. We're just trying to sell beer any which way we can. You know, we're just glad somebody's taking a keg of our beer and giving us 200 bucks. We're thrilled, but it's a long game. It's not, it's just not that easy. Selling that keg, that one keg, there's, you know, another 12 months of long game that comes with it. I love this conversation. There's, there's, a, there's a lot to it. And, I'm, and Paul, thanks for giving us this avenue to kind of talk freely. I think there's probably a lot more questions that people are too afraid to ask. I know Tim Garman had one, even though it was answered. Tim, do you want to ask that? Yeah, I was just curious um, about the margins. What are, what are the average margins? I, I've heard like 40%. I, I think somebody wrote me back 30, 35, but what, what are you guys seeing out there? It's, it's anywhere between 27 and 35. Okay. And I know that seems like a really wide margin. I've worked with distributors that charge 27%. Um, I feel like they're on the short end and I've worked with, you know, distributors that charge, you know, work within 35%. And I think that's on the high end. And I think you should negotiate that. Ultimately, it's like anything else. You sell your beer to somebody, it's theirs now. They could do whatever they want with it legally. You know, they could charge whatever PTR, PTC, whatever it be. However, um, you should be having those conversations like, hey, I want to land on the shelf somewhere around $15.99 a four pack. What do I need to sell you that beer? You know, what do I need to sell you my beer to to hit, you know, so that you're delivering the beer to the retailer to hit at $15.99. And in person, you can have those conversations. You'll never see anything in writing. You won't get an email. Um, you may see it on a spreadsheet here and there, but that's where they get really guarded. They do not like talking pricing, uh, especially amongst other breweries. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of vague, Tim. It's anywhere between 27 to 35. I will say this, it, maybe it's just me, but I find that the wholesalers that work on the higher end of margin they also have a lot more incentive to go out and sell more beer because they stand to make more money. That's my experience. I'm not saying it works for everybody. Great. Thank you. There, there's a question that was directly to me, but I, I don't, your screen name is A.O. Degard. Not sure who that is. Go ahead and ask that question. Yeah, what I was one. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, what I was wondering is if you, if you have lost kegs, if you signed a contract, are they liable for lost kegs and you don't lose out on lost kegs of your versus self-distributing and you can't collect? Yeah, that's a great question. And I don't really know if I have, I, I don't have a lot of experience in that. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I can answer that question specifically. I mean, that this is where if you are going to work with a distributor, I think engaging in Kegworks or MicroStar or somebody like that is very valuable because then you don't have to worry about it. If you own your own cooperage, that creates, a, and we do, and I'm frankly petrified about my beer going to market and collecting the cooperage back, even though it says prison city all around it, um, it just makes it harder than you know, renting you know, or leasing kegs through Kegworks or MicroStar or anybody else. Um, legally, I, I don't, maybe Brendan could touch on that, but I, I it would have to be in your contract to, um, hold them accountable for something like that. Yeah. Mark, yeah. Right. um, and that's yeah. definitely not in your typical contract. Um, it, it certainly won't be in what the wholesaler gives you. That'd be something you'd have, you'd have to add. Um, and what I've seen, I mean, I've seen it done one of two ways and there's definitely a better way among those. One is put it right in your contract charge a lost keg fee yeah. you know they lost keg fee is whatever fifty dollars whatever it is um i've also people seen people do it on like if they've already signed a contract they'll put it on their invoices um that's a much uh more gray area from a legal standpoint whether they're bound by that um there's a whole body of law developed around whether um you know uh, competing forms like you like your purchaser and the invoice and like, you know, what, what applies versus an underlying agreement. Um, so to the extent you're on the front end of it and you can put in your contract, um, it shouldn't be something that they should really be able to fight against. If they lose a keg, okay. you know, it, it's really, you know, they should have that in their contract or their agreement with their retailers, right? If 
they lose a keg, the retailer should have to you know, pay them the fee and then the fee should go back up to you. Um, so the, the extent you can do on the front end, slap that right in your contract. Um, if, you, if you're already in the arrangement, um, contracts can always be changed, you know? Um, just, just send them an email, say, hey, you know, what are we doing going forward about this problem? Um, you don't have a ton of leverage because you're earning the contract and these are notoriously, notoriously difficult to get out of. Um, but, you know, see what they say. And if that doesn't work, throw on in your invoice and, you know, you at least have something to fall back on. Yeah, thank you. I see uh, so there's two things I want to, I'm seeing one specifically from Erica um, in, in, in the chat saying, I highly recommend getting friendly with spreadsheets and to track all those kegs. Uh, and check in so you know what's out there in bistro. I know you meant distro. Um, but that does actually hit on another point about getting familiar with tracking. And if you are getting into a relationship with a distributor, you need to be diligent about tracking every goddamn thing you do. Every email needs to be saved. If you're in the market and you call on 10 accounts, you need to send an email to your brand manager. I visited these 10 accounts. This is what I did today. Um, if you're going to you know, get into a relationship with a distributor and you're doing work with, so you need to recap, 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 keep track of every single thing that you're doing to help them sell your beer. Because I'll tell you this, they're doing it. They're keeping track of every single thing you do and don't do. Specifically, hey, hey this person had a ride with, they didn't show up. Uh, they had a ride with, they did, you know, they, they are almost instinctively just creating a file on the side of all the things you didn't do as a weapon against you. And you need to be very cognizant of that. Yeah, if I could jump in there, if you're ever, if the relationship is ever spoiling or you feel like it's not going the right direction, you should be doing the same exact thing. Like every time you hear a complaint from an account, write it down. Every time an account sends you an email saying, hey, you know, these guys didn't get what I wanted or I ordered this, they gave me this or I charged the wrong price, save that email, put it in a file somewhere. Um, yep. Just get as many quiver, get as many arrows in your quiver as you can. Yeah. I will, this sounds a lot of negative energy and I want to kind of circle back to something. Distributors are extremely valuable. They can help you grow your brand. They can take a ton off your plate. It's, it's ultimately up to you. Just don't assume that you can just hand your brand off to somebody and they're going to take care of it the way that you do. You still need to be emotionally and financially invested in that growth of your brand. Think about it. They are your, if you sign with a distributor, they immediately become your biggest customer. So why not treat them that way? Treat them like gold, go out there, work with them, have a relationship. These guys are all relationship based. They love getting out. They love having beers. Uh, Ethan mentioned something. Is there anything that really incentivizes sales team other than cash? Yeah. Hanging out with the brewers, going to the brewery, doing a collab day, visiting your brewery, being in your market for the day. There are these guys, they're just dudes and, and women. They're just people that are really passionate about beer more so now than I've ever seen before. It used to just be, you know, throw thousands of dollars at me and I'm going to go put up big stacks. A lot more people, younger people, people that are invested in craft beer are entering distributorships and they want to be part of this cool thing that we all have going on. So you can have a great relationship with your wholesaler, but you need to take ownership of that. It's that they're not just going to deliver it. They're just not going to show up as a white knight, you know, in shining armor and throw you on the back of the horse and take you for the ride, you know. There needs to be an invested relationship there, and you can take ownership of that. You can be the just you know the brand that kind of pushes everything forward, but that, that that's going to have to be up to you. You know, if you're invested in it and you treat them properly, and you and you, you I'm not saying you need to wine and dine them, but you work hard, you show them that you're working hard, you track your work, you deliver results to them. They're going to want to work hard for you too. Ian, I saw you have a question. Yeah, so um, we at Lucky Hair, we had uh, uh, signed with a distributor uh, during the summer here in 2020 um, and have certainly learned a lot of everything that's being said on this uh, conversation. Um, 
But one of the things when we were speaking to them about joining was, you know, the process of them selling beer to all these different accounts. And one of the things that uh, we took into consideration, but haven't really been able to implement due to uh, COVID and all the restrictions is that, you know, you're doing these ride alongs, but you're almost sometimes selling your beer twice. You're selling your beer, uh, maybe a new SKU to uh, the wholesaler, but then you need to be out on these ride alongs or visiting these accounts by yourself to then sell beer that you've already sold to yep. uh, the, the distributor because they might have a sales force of two dozen reps, but that doesn't mean they're selling your beer, especially as somebody like us, we're small potatoes. They're not making a ton of money off of us or, or there's really no incentives outside of the few reps that wanted us to join um, with this, they're with, with them and work with them. So yep. um, it's not just as easy as that pallet gets onto the trailer and then see you later. Like you're still responsible for trying to make sure that beer then leaves their yep. uh, cold room. And it's, and it's once COVID lifts and we can get back to tastings and stuff like that, I've been, we got to be on the road with them once a week and doing tastings at all new places, especially for, you know, a brewery that's not in Rochester or Buffalo and our name's not known, we got to get out there and do it. So sure. the distributor is definitely not the cure-all. It's, it's more work. You move, move more beer for less money and more work, but in the grand scheme, you're more people are getting to try what you're making. And that's, I think what's most important. So. Yeah, it is. When you are with, it doesn't matter. Listen, we're all in a long game, no matter how you look at it. Just opening a tap room, self-distribution, working with traditional three-tier system, none of it. It's all the same conversation. It is a long game. It's a hustle. It never ends. There are only a few people that are out there that can just make beer, open their doors and sell every drop of liquid out their tap room in a weekend. And even that's, uh, I would say if any of us are paying attention is dwindling. I think that's becoming less and less of a reality. Um, I think even some of the most popular breweries, you're starting to see self distributing and doing some things that many of us thought they wouldn't have to do. Um, but it is a long game. It's a tireless, you know, it doesn't end. Um, you got to be ready to hustle and just work in, in your right end. Yeah. It, it's not just handing it off and, and you do, find yourself like, Hey, I got this tap line and now I have to remind the distributor I've got the tap line and they have to deliver the keg. And it's not just like, Hey, Joe at uh, alehouse said he's taking a keg. It's you got to call the rep, make sure he's taking the keg. The reality is, and I'll say this, you will hear from your distributor rep this line. Well, what's it replacing? You know, if it's replacing one of my lines, eh, fuck you. Uh, maybe your keg's not going in because I need that line to hit an incentive. You really want to make friends with your distributor, know their portfolio, know their competition, walk into the sales room at five o'clock in the afternoon and throw three blue moon handles on a bud distributor's desk and say, I just knocked these lines off today, bitches. Let's go. Uh, we got about no. 10, we got about 10 minutes. I'm sorry, Brendan, do you have an Unless answer? your distributor is a bud house, in which case, no. Yeah. <laughs> We've got about 10 minutes left. Uh, a couple of questions. Daniel Thorne, go ahead. You can unmute yourself if you're there. There you go. Hi guys, um, thank you for this. Uh, we we are a brewery that is is growing, and we we are self distributing. It's essentially me, um, but we are we are thinking about because we're growing into a different market, a different area of the state. How do we how do we do that? And you've you've kind of touched on this. And um, is it worth doing a fulfillment partnership? with a distributor. Uh, can you expand on fulfillment partnership? I'm not really familiar with what you mean there. The, they've offered to just essentially be doing the invoicing and the, dis, the distribution, the logistic part of it, but then it would still be us or me going out and selling. And they would take, they would take that aspect of it. Hmm. Well, I, I think if that were the case, I'd negotiate heavily on what margins they're working on. If you're going to be out there doing all the work, but they're making the money. I don't know. That, this, that's, this one's a little bit new to me. Brendan, do you have any advice? No, that's new to me as well. I mean, it sounds, frankly, more honest, right? I mean, isn't that yeah. kind of what their most distributors are doing anyway? Um, I, I sort of like the idea. I mean, if, if that's what it is, you're still signing up, you know, depending on the state and almost every state, 
it's sort of a permanent marriage you're entering into. Um, so like Mark said, I would just use that as an opportunity to negotiate margin, negotiate termination fee, uh, marketing spend, um, everything. Yep. Okay. Erica, Erica had a good question and John Anthony and also had a good answer, but Erica, go ahead. Yeah, I just, you know, listening to this wonderful conversation, it's, it does keep making me beg the question of why on earth would you do this if you can self-distribute as long as possible? Right. What, what exactly is that tipping point? I mean, is it when you start spending so much money paying other people within your organization to handle all the sales and distribution? Is it your sanity? Is it, you know, just getting beer out there? Geography. What is the... I guess for other people, other smaller breweries who have gone with a distributor, what was your, what was your ultimate tipping point to do that? I can't answer that because we haven't yet. Um, maybe there's uh, people on here that self-distributed. I'm looking at Ethan that, you know, ultimately went with the distributor. But the, Erica, ultimately, I would say this is right. I. Knowing what we've just expanded into in my experience in distribution, we will self-distribute for as long and hard as we can, for as long as we can. And ultimately, I'd like to empower my people. I'd rather invest in a fleet of trucks and have salespeople delivering beer around the state as so long as financially it makes sense, as long as the bottom line looks healthy. I'd rather hire people. I know how muddled the waters are of distribution. Let's face it. There's almost 9,000 breweries in the country. You know, there's 500 of us in New York State. You know, how much can a wholesaler absorb before, I would, I would argue a lot of brands are just lost in a distributor's portfolio right now. So unless new distributors come along, which we have seen, you know, we've seen Remarkable pop up in Albany and they are relatively new, right? Five years old. Uh, Serene, I think, is relatively new. Maybe we see some smaller boutique distributors, Rhino and Rochester. But, you know, ultimately, it's kind of the same thing. Like, they're small distributors. Do they have the reach that maybe you need more than if you were just doing it yourself? I mean, it, it is definitely a, a catch-22 conversation. There's no right or wrong answers. Ultimately, it just comes down to your bottom line, what makes the most sense for your business? Does it make more sense to expand and buy trucks and send people from, I think you're out in Albany, right? In the Albany area? Yeah, near Saratoga. Right? Yeah, so does it make sense to hire, you know, somebody to go out to Rochester, Buffalo once a week and drop kegs off and come back and you're paying that person? Or does it make more sense to sign with the distributor? It, ultimately, it's up to the individual to figure out what that tipping point is to move. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not. Yeah, no, it does. And I, I love the idea of hiring our own people to, to do that stuff because the other great thing too is that your own employees are going to be so much more involved intimately with yep. you and your brand. And it also doesn't necessarily mean that sales is the only thing that they're going to be doing. There could right. be other things that they're interested in that they could be helping out with within the brewery. So... You, know, you can still share the love with different employees, but you know, have them doing other things too to keep them passionate. Yes, and I would say yes, but ultimately, I, and I'll say this: like, um, you know, everyone wants to be a bartender for a certain amount of time. You know, everybody wants to be a server because the money's good till a certain amount of time. Everyone wants to go be the brewery employee for a certain amount of time. You know, so you, now you have to start considering like your turnover factor. You know, how, how long is somebody going to be, I know, I thought it was cool delivering beer at my own brewery and I'm a mile down the road for about two weeks. And I'm like, fuck this, you yeah, guys yeah. do it. I'm paying you guys, you guys go do it. And guess what? They're like, fuck you. This sucks. Can we hire somebody else? <laughs> and it's been a month, a month. So now you're asking somebody, it sounds all cool to get in a van and drive out to Buffalo and drop beer off and like, Hey, what's up? Let's have a fried bologna sandwich. And then, you know, a month later, they're like, this blows Yep. You know, so it, it you know, it, it, it's like, it's any business. Um, and ultimately I think that's the value. I'm not trying to sell you on wholesalers, but that's the value of the wholesaler. That's their problem. 
We've got uh, two questions before we have to wrap it up. Ethan, go ahead and then Haley, we'll finish with you and then um, we'll end. Next year, two hours, Paul. I know. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll keep it super fast because I was just tagging on to the question about when you decide you know, to, to stop self-distribution. Mm -hmm. There's a quick answer uh, that I could give you, which is when you drop a full half barrel keg on your foot, loading it up, <laughs> Break two metal tarsals and still deliver the fucker. Yep. Yep. Down in the back yeah. of, the basement of the Sterling Tavern, which I'm sure at least a few of you uh, can yep. think of. Um, but the other answer is like after you've done an exhaustive uh, spreadsheet based analysis of the costs and everything, and you find out that like if you were paying yourself like you pay a distributor, your margins aren't as good as theirs because they they buy fuel much cheaper and they get their right. trucks fixed much cheaper and like they've got all these economies of scale that are really 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 hard to beat um, as you try to grow your own distribution to meet that so yeah there's a lot of advantages to doing it yourself but yeah when their you know, truck breaks down there's somebody there in 30 minutes fixing it when your truck breaks down you're on the side of the road for three hours. Or more. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So. Haley, we'll, we'll end with you. Okay. Um, hey, thanks to everybody. This has been a really great conversation. Um, my question is sort of related and it's about how to um, balance self-distribution that's, you know, maybe doable in local markets, but then trying to reach out to kind of more far-flung territories and how to <laughs> engage you know, how to find a distributor that's a good fit in markets that are less familiar or, you know, how to kind of piece together that type of arrangement where you're doing a mix of self-distribution and then trying to find a, a distributor to those, you know, further out territory. Any advice? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, there's been several examples of breweries that have self-distributed. Um, I know we worked with one in the Rochester market where we actually delivered their package to retail, but they sold their own draft. Um, and that was a pretty healthy relationship for a long time and until it wasn't. Um, and there are difficult conversations to have there, but if you can self-distribute in your own market, I say do that as long as you can. And, you know, wholesalers will be interested in good brands. And if, they're, if your brand is known and you, the accounts seem interested, they will sign you and, you know, outside of your home market. I, I hope that answers your question, but that's ultimately how that I think works. If I'm, if you're in Utica and I'm just, I don't know you, Haley, I'm just making up a thing. And you come to me in Rochester and say, Hey, I self distribute in Utica and we do really well. I have these few brands and I, I'd like to enter the Rochester market and I try your beer and they seem worthy and the pricing seems right. Uh, and there's some interest at the account level. I'm probably going to entertain the conversation about bringing you in. So maybe start with the accounts and see, you know, if they're trying to generate interest at the level of the accounts and then yes. maybe, maybe start learn self, about- Self-distribute to that market that you're interested in. And let me tell you, nothing piques a wholesaler's interest other than someone that's stealing their business. You know, if you're self-distributing in Rochester and they, they notice you're picking up lines left and right and you reach out and say, hey, is anybody interested? If they notice that you're making waves in that market, they're going to be interested. Is, is it starting at the level of the account a good way to maybe learn about distributors that are yes. you know, good in that, in that market? Yeah, okay. And I said, I don't, I don't know when you joined in and I, I know I get a little scattered, but due diligence, any brewery that's thinking about entering a market, your number one thing you should do is spend a day or two in the market interviewing accounts. Who's your preferred distributor and why? Who do you like to work with and why? Who don't you? You're going to get a lot of the same answers, but it's going to help you indefinitely to determine who you want to get into bed with. That's a tremendous help. Thank you so much. Cheers. So we've reached the end. Any final thoughts, Brendan and, and Mark, before we wrap this up? Um, I would just say, you know, be very careful at the beginning and the end of these relationships. As Marcus said, you know, evaluate whether it makes sense to do it at all. I totally agree that you should self-distribute as long as you can, as far as you can. It makes more sense when your trucks just don't want to go that far. Um, and if you take care of it on the front end, like if you negotiate a good contract, it'll be a thousand times easier to get out of it on the back end. Um, both from a 
logistic standpoint and from a monetary standpoint. So just be super careful at the at the birth stage and the divorce stage. I feel like my last bit of advice is maybe we should invest in billboards to, you know, counter all the other lawyers that litter our cities with, you know, hurting a car or whatever. We should have Brandon Palferman's face with a pint of beer. Like if you're thinking about entering a distri di distribution contract, call. I'll come Nothing up with some catchy with phrase. Yeah, I, I'll come up with some catchy phrase. Um, <laughs> But yeah, do, do your homework, do your due diligence, lawyer up, make sure you're protected. And um, I guess that, that ultimately would be my final bit of advice. Well, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Brendan. I feel like there's going to be a chapter two of this next year when we do this live at the Albany Cap Center. I think it's something we need to continue. Obviously, I do feel like we could talk another hour on this. I know it's- I could go on for four hours. I actually have two more pages of notes I haven't even gotten into yet. <laughs> I'm sorry that it's, it was only an hour. Good, man. You're going to leave them wanting more. George Costanza, right? For those for that <laughs> reference. You're going to leave them wanting more. Uh, so thank you all. Um, I appreciate you guys very much doing this and uh, we will do it again next year. A lot of good information. Our next session is in just a few minutes uh, with Chris Shepard, US Craft Trends and Trajectories. There's a lot of great information on that as well. A lot of great numbers. He's fantastic um, as well. So, so join us. And then um, all of these are gonna be uploaded on YouTube. So if you feel like you missed something, um, subscribe to our YouTube page and we will uh, have everything up on there as well for you to review. So All right. Thanks. Much. Next year, Thank everyone you. get your shots so we can get stupid messed up next year. Do this hungover like. Amen to that. Oh, let's go. <laughs> thanks, everybody. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.